As we gather for worship this morning, let's begin singing praise to our Lord who sits on the throne from hymn 439, Christ Shall Have Dominion, hymn 439. morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to see you all this morning and to worship the King together with you. That is who we come to worship. We come to worship our triune God through our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, to offer Him the praise that is due to His name. He is worthy to receive your worship and ours together as His church. It's good to be here. We uh, This morning we'll have our time of worship. Afterwards we'll have a time of refreshments and fellowship. We'll not have a time uh, of formal sermon discussion today. Um, and, uh, but we'll have time for refreshments and lots of uh, opportunity for, uh, for discussion together in our, in our conversation. Um, a couple notes um, for the congregation that we have, uh, as Justine had emailed, there's the uh, presbytery sign-up sheets on the back bulletin board, so please take a look at that and see if you might be able to uh, contribute to our, the presbytery meetings that we'll be hosting in late September. Um, closer uh, to now, we have our afternoon uh, service, and our, it's our first outdoor service this year, and um, that will be at our regular time of 4.30, but please come a bit earlier if you can to help with setup. We'll have a, a prayer meeting time at, uh, 
um, 350 or so here in the sanctuary. Uh, on uh, Thursday, um, we had wonderful weather and about 200 or so invitations out in the neighborhood. It seems every year we go, every, everybody goes a little bit further up the street. Um, and, uh, and so that's great. Uh, we're reaching a bit further, and I know a number of you just with friends, family, local neighborhoods. So lots of invitations are out. This year we noticed that um, in our neighborhood here, a few more people are starting to slowly penetrate into people's minds. A few more people remembering, oh yeah, right, you know, we were going to come out last year, we didn't make it. And there were just, uh, just a recognition of the church, knowing where the church is seems to be a bit more so it's uh, some progress and some good conversations at the door and uh, opportunity to pray with one gentleman. Um, and so it's just pray for the Lord's work, both in the service and all the other interactions that we pray will continue and, and grow. So we look forward to that. It should be an exciting, uh, an exciting time um, and a great time to worship, the, uh, worship our God together and with other believers that we've invited from other local churches and just to fellowship, but also to worship. That's what we come together to do. So look forward to that this afternoon, and we're thankful we can do that and begin our day with worship as well. Let's take a few moments to prepare ourselves for uh, worship, and let's ask the Lord in silent prayer for His grace upon us. Brothers and sisters, please stand and hear your God call you to worship this morning. We come at His call. He speaks to us through His Word. Revelation 5, picture of heaven as John looks and sees uh, the praise in heaven. And we join, our, uh, we join the, the hosts in glory who worship the Lamb. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Now let us pray and seek our great God who sits upon the throne through our Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for calling us to worship and we respond in prayer, giving you, Lord, submitting ourselves to you, humbling ourselves under you to come and pray to you. Lord, we bless and praise your name. Lord, for you are the King who sits upon the throne, and the day is coming when every single knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. But already now, O God, in your grace and mercy, you have touched our hearts, and you have brought us by faith to see that you are the Lord, and you've brought us, Lord, uh, not, not bowing us as, as enemies, uh, Lord, who, are, who must submit uh, with grief and anger. Lord, to you, but you've brought us to be your friends, those who delight to worship you, to, to declare that you are Lord. Lord, we have the privilege of joining the heavenly host and all the saints who have gone before us in giving you the praise that is due your name. We praise you, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for all your glory, all that radiates throughout and into this world and into our hearts concerning your holiness and power and truth and your gracious disposition towards the sons of men. On this day, we praise you for the eternal plan of salvation, the Lamb who was slain for our salvation, who humbled himself so low and then was exalted high, being resurrected in glory and raised up to sit at the right hand of the Father. We thank you that through his blood we are able to meet with you, O Lord, and to serve you in truth in this hour of worship. We thank you for the Spirit within by whom we're made ready to worship. 
and our hearts are prepared. We enter then into this holy dialogue with you. You've called us to worship. We respond in faith, and so it goes until you dismiss us with your blessing. And Lord, we thank you for this. We pray that all our responses would be done in truth and in faith from pure hearts through Christ. The privilege of fellowship is ours, O Lord. We thank you for giving it to us, and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sing praise to our God, hymn number five, God my King, thy might confessing. God reveals His will to us in His Word that we would obey Him, follow Him, serve Him as His people. We do so only through the grace given to us in Jesus Christ. We do not obey Him so as to make Him happy with us and and to gain any favor of His that is given freely to us in Christ. But as Christians, we hear His Word and we submit to Him in faith and with joy. And so we hear His Word, we hear His commands to us as we turn to Psalm 119 uh, from verses 33 to 40 the hay section, verses 33 to 40 of Psalm 119. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Let's seek from the Lord the grace to treasure His word as we ought to for forgiveness for when we haven't, and that we would walk more faithfully before Him. Lord our God, we praise and thank You for, Lord, Your statutes and Your judgments and Your precepts. We thank You for the good teaching that You give to us. We do ask for increased knowledge and understanding, Lord, that we would know more of what Your Word declares and how we ought to obey it in our everyday lives. And we pray for greater faithfulness and desire to obey you, 
to have the, the, the prayers of the psalmist upon our lips, that you would teach us that we might obey, that we might delight in serving you. Lord, you have given us your word, and we must treasure it with our whole hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, has ascended up into heaven, and from there he sends gifts to us. He has sent his Holy Spirit to inspire the completion of the word of God, that we would have the whole of your revelation for us in this life, everything that we need to know concerning you and what duty you require of us. Lord Jesus, you have graciously sent pastors and teachers and, and elders and, and Lord, to, to teach, to instruct your church, to explain and to apply your word, Lord, that we might know its, uh, its application for our life today. We thank you for the commands, the timeless commands of the Scriptures. We pray that you would continue to lead us into all truth by your Holy Spirit as we study your word, as we take up and read. O oh Lord, give us thankful hearts for you and your truth. Give us to treasure it and not grow tired of it, not be bored with it, not just go through the motions of it, but, Lord, that we would have a great desire, a hunger, uh, Lord, to, to drink in your truth, and, Lord, that it would strengthen our lives and be demonstrated in our lives. Forgive us when we neglect your truth for another truth, because your truth makes us uncomfortable, or we don't like the cost of following it and obeying you. Lord, rather give us understanding that we would keep your laws and statutes. Forgive us when we look to worthless things in this world and desire them, for they seem better or easier or more pleasant. Lord, those ways lead to death. Only your way leads to life. Give us only to have eyes for your truth and a heart that only wants to follow you. Remind us that through the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, that this, the, the burden of obedience to you is, is easy, that his yoke is light because he makes it so. He equips and enables us. May we by faith obey you. It's the only true and right uh, obedience to obey in faith, Lord, and to trust you to give us the strength to obey and to persevere in it. Banish remaining unbelief from our hearts and any thoughts that you might be unfaithful to your word, that you might abandon us and, and, and forget us and not be with leading us in truth and enabling us to obey as you promise. Rather, Lord, make us more faith-filled and obedient to you. Thank you for our Savior who has gone before us in perfect obedience. Forgive us for his sake and enable for, for our sins and enable us to follow him wherever he leads. And we know that by him, one day we will enter into glory to dwell with you in perfection, Father, forever growing in knowledge and forever praising you, never to sin again. There forever, perfectly, to delight in your truth. So, Lord, now already we pray, give us that, give us that delight, and we bless your name that through Christ it is even possible. We bless you and thank you. We thank you for forgiveness in his name, and we thank you for new desires. We look to you in faith in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus was preaching to, uh, to the multitudes, many who had once professed him, went, walked away. Uh, we read in John 6, verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the twelve disciples, do you, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And by grace, may we make that same true profession. And so live for him, trusting he is our God. He will not leave us nor forsake us. He will enable us to walk faithfully and follow him until glory. Blessed be his name. At this time, we will sing hymn 163. At the name of Jesus, we'll collect our tithes and offerings in, as an act of thankfulness to our God, an act of worship and thankfulness to our God, we'll, because we won't have an offering in this afternoon service, so both uh, offerings will go into this offering this morning. We'll sing hymn, hymn 163. the Father. 
Turn the Word of God to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. We'll read the second half of the chapter from verses 14 to 25. It's from this section of the Old Testament that Paul will draw the language that he uses in Philippians 2. Uh, verses 9 to 11 that we're going to consider this morning. But consider this and consider Christ as the fulfillment of these great words of mercy and compassion that, uh, that are here in Isaiah 45. So Isaiah 45, verses, uh, 14, beginning at verse 14. Thus says the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Cush and of the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over to you, and they shall be yours. They shall walk behind you, they shall come over in chains, and they shall bow down to you. They will make supplication to you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other. There is no other God. Truly you are God who who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them. They shall go in confusion together, who are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth, I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge, who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. A just God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, Surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. And in the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. 
Last week we considered verses uh, 5 through 8. This week we're going to consider verses 9 to 11. I'll read uh, verses 1 to 11 this morning. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. As we come to consider Christ's exaltation this morning, take up your bulletin. And we'll confess our faith using Short Westminster Shorter Catechism 28. Wherein consisteth Christ's exaltation? Christ's exaltation consisteth in His rising again from the dead on the third day in ascending up into heaven, in sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and in coming to judge the world at the last day. Amen. Let's take a moment to ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word this morning. Lord, we thank You that You are the God who reveals Yourself to us with words of salvation. We thank You, Lord, that we get to hear of these words again this morning, and we pray that you would bring them to our hearts. You know the needs of each one here, each one joining us online. Uh, Lord, you uh, you know that we need to see Christ. We need to see Him in His exalted glory, and we need the grace to confess Him as our Lord. We pray that we would be able to do so in truth, and so live that truth out. Pray that you'd equip me to proclaim your word, that this word would that the, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, and as we think on these things together, would be faithful and true and consistent with your revelation. That we would hear the words of Christ and believe and be saved. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. My well, brothers and sisters in Christ, do you realize the cost? to a first century Christian of confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. At the time that the New Testament was written, and and in the Roman Empire, there was the, the imperial cult where the emperors were... Uh, love to do to declare themselves as Lord or as God that needed to be worshipped, and after they died, many of them by the Roman Senate were uh, elevated to the position of being a God who needed to be worshipped. In different parts of the empire, at different times, there were there were demands for people to to worship the emperor or a statue, or according to emperor's decrees, to do whatever obeisance they needed to do. Augustus, Caesar Augustus, who reigned over the Roman Empire at the time of Christ's birth, loved to call himself, he called himself the Son of God. He loved to call himself the chief priest of the Roman Empire. And he, uh, these things were, the, the chief, him as chief priest, it was the, uh, stamped on the Roman coins. Caligula, who uh, reigned um, in, in the time shortly after Christ's crucifixion, was 
wanted to be known as Lord. He even wanted to put a statue of himself for worship up in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, but he died before he was able to follow through on that plan. Domitian, who reigned uh, uh, near the end of the first century in the 90s, perhaps about the time that the book of Revelation was written, um, who exiled John uh, out of the empire, um, was, was also somebody who wanted to be worshipped and was willing to inf- certainly enforce that with a lot of bloodshed, one of the great persecutions in the early church. To be a Christian in the first century and to declare Jesus was Lord was a gra- came at a great cost because Caesar demanded such obedience and such honor and such worship. Now, Christians, of course, could honor the emperor in so far as he was appointed by God to reign over them. But they could not worship him nor bend the knee in, in an act of worship toward God. And through the empire, they were, they, they were uh, at times, they, they would be loose, you'd lose social status, you would uh, be rejected, ostracized, you would be abused, arrested, harassed, and killed for simply declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul's writing to the Philippians, to these Romans, uh, these Gentiles in a Roman city, these Roman citizens in this church, was not just a a statement of orthodoxy and this is what we believe and isn't it great and it'll, it'll work well in a catechism someday, although it is all those things, but this was a statement that uh, of early, the early Christian confession, this was simple, to say Jesus Christ is Lord was an early Christian confession that was costly to make. Now, still today in many parts of our world, it is extremely costly to make this confession because there are governments and they're, they're who demand that they be considered the God of the people. In North Korea, a number of years ago, a friend of mine uh, who at the time was an engineer, he he, uh, made, he made a humanitarian trip to North Korea. They were going to go dig wells. And he said, we got into the country, and they bring you to uh, the place where they have uh, these giant bronze statues of uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-il, who died in 2011, I think it was, and his father, Kim Il-sung. And, and these, were, these uh, leaders have been raised to, uh, to, to be deities among the people. They're to be honored and worshipped. And consider that, that that is where your devotion goes, not to anyone else or any other God, but to them. And see, uh, didn't have to bow down to these statues, but that isn't the option given to a North Korean citizen. To confess Jesus Christ as Lord puts you in a labor camp or ends your life and very likely the lives of your family as well. They go further than just you. They threaten your whole family. Now, for us in the West, to confess Jesus Christ as Lord for, for hundreds of years has not actually been that costly. I'm not saying it hasn't been costly. For some, for some of us, we've lost jobs, we've been ostracized, we've been mocked, we've been laughed at. There are different ways, and, and we, we've, we've, uh, we've been um, we've, that confessing Christ as Lord and following Him in obedience, actually li- living that out, has been costly. But by and large, it hasn't been all that costly for us as a society. It, it's it is something that we could confess with little fear. We can confess it now with little fear that someone's about to come in and, 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 uh, and demand worship of something else. But it is certainly becoming more costly. Because when we confess that Jesus Christ alone is Lord, it competes with others, with other men or man-centered dogmas that demand absolute obedience. And in our own culture, where we more and more worship the creature rather than the creator, this is going to become more and more of a problem, whether it's the dogmas of the sexual revolution or of the absolute authority of government or whatever, these, these things ha- that, that, that demand a submission, even to say, well, you could still worship Jesus, but he's secondary, we're first. Where it's no longer we'll all mutually tolerate each other, which was never going to work anyway to now, unless you affirm and bow down, you are intolerant and unworthy of participation in our society. And there are many who have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord who, when push comes to shove, will deny Him in order to remain more comfortable, in order to maintain their status, and to maintain their own lives. 
And the question for us as we read a text like this is, what about you? What about me? At what cost are we willing to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? By God's grace, as we consider these words and who Jesus Christ is this morning, may He give us the grace by His Spirit to bow the knee in truth and to make our confession true, and we would worship Him with our mouth and with our very lives. Worship the highly exalted Jesus Christ as Lord, and so bring glory to God. Worship the highly exalted Jesus Christ as Lord, and so bring glory to God. Verse 9, we have the Lord Jesus Christ highly exalted, a declaration of His exaltation. And then in verse, uh, verses 10 through the beginning of verse 11, we have the Lord Jesus Christ worship, the call for us to worship Him. And then at the end of verse 11, God glorified. Well, we begin our text with a, with a word, therefore. Last week we considered verses eight, uh, 5 to 8, and now verses 9 to 11 uh, are, are intimately connected. Last week we considered the humiliation of Christ, how He came down uh, out of glory. He added to Himself a humanity and was humbled. He humbled Himself, veiling uh, and, and, and uh, uh, making Himself of no reputation, veiling His deity, so that he was seen by most as no more than a mere man, though he came in our nature in order to save us according to our nature. He humbled himself, not needing to do so for his own sake, but for the glory of God and for us. And now, as having completed that work that we considered, we, there's a transition in what Paul's saying to the Philippians with this little word, therefore, because of what Jesus Christ has done, because He willingly humbled Himself and followed through the entire uh, plan of salvation that God the Father had ordained, so now, therefore, He is highly exalted. God the Father has highly exalted Him. Christ Jesus has gained the crown He was promised by His Father, through going through the cross and all the humiliation that that required. He died on the cross and he was buried, but now he is being exalted. He was first when he was raised up from the dead where the Father declared that his work was accepted, his work was done well, and then he ascended up into heaven, he was received into glory, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he awaits the time when he will come again to judge the world in righteousness. His exaltation continues. This is where Paul brings the Philippians to come from as he exhorts them uh, to uh, like-mindedness, to be of one mind in serving Christ. He exhorts them to humility as Christ was humble, and now he brings them to see the glory of Christ. Not only so that they will see that in, if they follow Christ and serve Him, they will also know His glory in themselves, but so that they would also, but they would first of all bow down and honor Him as the one who, for whom they ought to serve. The one, they ought to be like-minded with one another as Christians because of who Christ is. They owe Him that kind of obedience and submission. This Jesus Christ, the Father, has highly exalted. The Word is not just exalted, but Paul uses a, a, a term in the original language that, that, that tells us that it's, uh, he's exalted to the highest place, the loftiest of heights. He is at the right hand of God the Father. That is, that is to refer to the place of greatest authority and power the Father has given to Him as our mediator, as God and man, as the God-man. Now, Jesus Christ is exalted uh, he's exalted as the God-man. It's important for us to understand this. We, we understand that Christ is God, and He added to Himself a human nature. He has two natures in one person. It's a mystery, so we're not going to fully wrap our minds around this as we considered last week. But these, two na- these are two distinct natures in one person. Christ Jesus was not exalted. since Last week we considered Christ as humbling Himself, though we we acknowledge He did not become less God to do so. He did not leave His deity behind or any part of His deity behind to become a man. He veiled His deity for a time during His time on earth. So now, as, the, as, as God, He's not gaining a new divine status. He never lost His divine status. He never became less than God. He still remains God, though He never again will have His identity veiled. He'll never again, we'll never, we'd never again see Christ and say, 
that is just a mere man walking the earth. We will know him to in his glorified, exalted status as truly God and as truly man, for he is exalted. It is, it is his humanity here that is the focus of his exaltation, that as truly met, true man in our very nature which he sa- in which he saved us, he has been exalted and lifted up and exalted. As the God-man, he is highly exalted by God. Which is astounding to think that our own nature is in glory at the highest position of authority and power. Christ exalted in our, uh, in our humanity according to the promise of God, according to the great plan of salvation. Christ, in his high priestly prayer, when he prays to the Father, he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He said, I've completed the work you've called me to do. I've done so, humbling myself as this. Now glorify me as the God-man with the glory which I, which I had and remain, continue to have as God. You know, I need to consider who Christ, we considered last week who Christ was as he came into this world, as he humbled himself and contrast that, which is what Paul wants the people to do, to, to contrast that with who he now is as the glorified God-man. He was one born in a manger. Now he sits on a throne. He was one who came in abject poverty and now he has riches beyond compare. He is one who, who was mocked and ridiculed, laughed, laughed at, beaten, murdered, and now he reigns and rules over all the earth. He was one who was justly rejected by the Father on the cross because of our sin, but now has been gloriously accepted because he paid the ultimate price and he put that sin away. He is the great glorified mediator who in his humanity, in his humility rather, carried out his work of telling us about Christ as our prophet, of offering himself up as a sacrifice as our priest, and one who, as our, who came as, as, as a king who was promised all authority, and now he's gained that. Still as our mediator, he's been elevated up into glory. He still continues to reveal the will of God to us for our salvation, continues to send his spirit forth as our priest. He continues to make intercession for us there from the right hand of the Father in his glorified state, praying for us without ceasing. And as our king, he continues to, he reigns and rules and defends us. He reigns on our behalf. He cares for us. And he, he continues to send forth Uh, for the care of his church, that we would be healthy and strong and growing, that his kingdom will come to fullness. This is the highly exalted Lord that we bow the knee to. The Lord, therefore, God has highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. Now, what is that name? Some debate about this. Some say it's Jesus because of the next statement, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Though, it see, though, um, though that was a name he had before he was exalted. Others say it was Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, Lord. Um, though, again, there's a name he had before, and uh, I don't think it's as clear in the text. What I think this means, this is the, this is the, uh, the, the, the uh, I would say, the, the position of most of the Reformers, is that this doesn't refer to a specific name, but rather to the reputation of Jesus Christ. The name can also reference someone's reputation. You say, you say about somebody, oh, he has a good name in the community. That means his reputation is good in the community. It doesn't mean everyone likes the name Bob. It just means he has a good name. He has a good reputation. And so this could be read as that he has given him the reputation which is above every, reputa- every reputation. The focus is not on what specific title Jesus had, but on the fact that the titles that he has are infused with this glory that the Father has given to him. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Not as a magic incantation, but at the fact that Jesus will be recognized to be Lord and having the honor and the authority and the glory of God. And that that, that, that is what is being referred to here. Now, the language of the Father declaring this to be the case. This is fulfillment of what we read in Isaiah 45. When there it is, uh, it is Jehovah who's speaking. It is God who is speaking. 
and how every knee is going to bow, and every tongue will take an oath. I have sworn by myself, uh, Isaiah 45, verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall take an oath. That this is, this is now, this is the glory given to, to Christ this is every knee will bow before him. Every knee will submit themselves to him. He has, the, he, he will be acknowledged and known as the, to have the glory of God and to be worthy of that obedience, to be worthy of that honor. He was humbled, but now he comes raised up in glory and he declares what we read in the same chapter of Isaiah, verse 22, look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. He is the one to whom all must look for salvation and to whom all will bow. And He is the one, when you've looked to Him to be saved, who reigns and rules in power to bring you into His kingdom and to preserve you and keep you and love you as the great mediator of His people. Jesus Christ is highly exalted. He is the one highly exalted now as he had completed the work the Father has given him to do. Worship the highly exalted Jesus Christ as Lord and so bring glory to God. Christ has been exalted by the Father. And your response and my response is quite clear from this text. Our response is to be true, genuine obedience and true, genuine worship as we bow the knee before him. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that, in order that, for the purpose that, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is to be worshiped. You and I are to recognize this name that he has been given, to recognize his glory. And the Father not only says that this will, that this might happen, that this should happen, but he's saying he's going to make it happen. He's going to exalt Christ that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and when Jesus walked this earth and he was in this, he was, he was, uh, engaged in his earthly ministry, he was hated and humiliated, he was mocked, and, and uh, he went through all of this for the salvation of his people, and he humbled himself, ultimately in obedience to the Father. But now the Father wants to know, this is my beloved and faithful Son. He's lifting him up for all to see. This is what Peter says at Pentecost when he's preaching about this, this exalted Christ, his last words, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And every knee will bow. Now, to bow the knee means to acknowledge his office, to give him honor, to acknowledge him as king. Just as, you know, we might come before Queen Elizabeth and, and bow the knee in, 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 in a way of honoring her office and authority. But more than that, and much more than that, this means this is an act of worship, which is not how we come before Queen Elizabeth, but it is how we come before Jesus Christ. We bow the knee, we worship Him as very God. We worship Him in this highly exalted place in the thrones of heaven. He is worthy of your worship. And as we bow the knee, it's a biblical posture of humility and of submission, which if you're trusting in Jesus Christ this morning is a wonderful place to be, then you want to bow the knee before Him because you recognize who He is. You recognize His glory. You know Him as your King. And you love Him as one of His subjects. And you willingly come and you bow the knee. And you, are, you want to give Him the honor and the glory that is due to His name. And so we have the privilege to, have to, have our, to bow our knees before Him with a new spirit, a new heart, no longer to be an enmity and rebellion, but to love Him as our sovereign. But the text speaks to the truth that every knee will bow without exception, using a, a, a way of, of, of expressing it, of, of comprehensiveness, saying that every knee uh, uh, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, it's referring to every, every 
uh, every single person or every single being that is able to offer worship to God. It's a comprehensive statement. And we can think of it, if you want to think of it, in each category of those uh, who remain on the earth, of those uh, uh, who have preceded us to heaven and with the angels, those who have, who, uh, who have entered into hell with the demons. We will all bow the knee to Jesus Christ. And if you don't want to bow the knee to Jesus Christ this morning, let me tell you, you still will. It is not a matter of if you will bow the knee. It is very clear it is just a matter of when you will bow the knee. When Jesus was being mocked before his crucifixion, the soldiers of Herod would take him and they beat him. And they did all sorts of things to make fun of him as the king. And they mockingly even bowed the knee. Mark 5 verse 19. They, they bowed the knee to him. Hail, king of the Jews. Ha! Some king you think you are. But their mockery will become reality when they will bow that knee. As Jesus says about those who crucified him. You'll see him coming on the clouds in glory. Those, you'll see him whom you've pierced. Everyone will bow the knee. Isaiah 45 again, as we come to the end of that that section. To him all men shall come and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. The whole chapter, that that just summarizes really what what we read, where, where the enemies, all the enemies of God's people and of God would come, and they will bow the knee to him. They will submit to him. They will come whether they, they think they will or not. But then the great hope for his people. And the Lord, all the descendants of Israel, shall be justified and shall glory. So the question is, if you're not trusting in Jesus Christ, if you don't want to bow the knee, the question for you this morning is, you will at some point. Will you do so with joy and submission, with repentance and humility this morning, or are you going to wait until he forces you to your knees in judgment? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Again, every single tongue will confess To confess means to openly declare that simple statement, Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, in faith, you make this public public statement. You, uh, You align yourself with Christ. You publicly declare your allegiance when you do so with a true heart and faith, which you've done if you've become a communicant member of this particular congregation. You've confessed, you've made this confession and and it is something, uh, boys and girls, as you've been baptized into membership in Christ, that you know also need to come personally to make that confession of faith, that Jesus Christ is Lord with all that it entails, including absolute submission to Jesus Christ. But it's a statement that every single Christian must make, and not just with lip service, but with their whole lives. It is good to confess it with the tongue that needs to come out of a true heart of faith. And as, I, as we opened, we understand that this, for the Philippians to hear this, this is a costly confession. They were reminded of the costly confession they themselves had made, that Jesus Christ is Lord. But Paul also wants them to recognize that this is not just to be reminded of the cost of confessing Christ, but this also is a great encouragement because Jesus Christ is Lord. That means all these other so-called lords that wanted to lord it over them, like Caesar, even Caesar, who wanted demanded obedience that only God could demand, they were actually under the control of Jesus Christ. That The people of God, you and I, do not need to fear because Jesus Christ is actually Lord. It's not just a good sticker to put on your bumper sticker, or your your bumper, it's not just a bumper sticker that that means nothing. It It means everything. Men can kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. And even if they come to kill the body, Jesus Christ is still in control of it all. To deny Jesus Christ and to bow down to Caesar would maybe give you a few more comfortable years in this life, but in eternity to pay for the wrong allegiance. But to declare Jesus Christ is Lord may make life hard and difficult, but Christ is with you always. And then he'll usher you into an eternal glory where the troubles of this life will fade away in light of the glory of dwelling with our God and worshiping him as king forever. 
Thus Paul tells the Romans in Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. To confess Jesus Christ as Lord is not something you'll ever come to regret. And he will never let you be put to shame. He is with you because he is your Lord. You can trust him. If you make that confession, if that is your confession by faith this morning, brothers and sisters, you're standing on solid ground. You're standing on the firmest foundation you could possibly stand on. And you do not need to fear. And whoever will demand of you the allegiance that is to be given to Jesus Christ alone or whatever system of thought, whatever government might want to demand that kind of allegiance, you can know will all one day, all those involved will bow the knee before Jesus Christ and they will acknowledge him to be Lord. Not us, but you, O Lord. And they will bow the knee in judgment. That's a day we long for. Because it's the, it's the time that you and I are ready now by faith acknowledge him to be Lord. And it should be our great heart's desire for God's kingdom to come and for all people to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. That's why we invite them to come and worship with us. That's why we invite and we talk to people about Christ. Yes, we want them to be saved and go to heaven. But our primary motivation is the glory of God. And that is for them to acknowledge Christ as he ought to be acknowledged. That he is Lord and our lives must be given to him. And one day that will come for every single knee and every tongue. Worship the highly exalted Christ, Jesus Christ as Lord and so bring glory to God. Well, what do we confess Christ to be Lord for? I just alluded to that. We do it to glorify God. That's why we confess Jesus Christ as Lord, because it brings glory to God. To, uh, to confess Jesus Christ as Lord is to fulfill our, our chief end, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is glorified when you make a true confession of Him. And as we, we talked about last week and some in the sermon discussion, this does not mean that God's intrinsic glory or who He is as God is added to. God doesn't need us to make Himself as glorious as He is. But it means that we will give him the glory that is due his name, that we in our own hearts can certainly give God more glory. We can praise him better and more richer than we do. And that is, that is what we bring when we truly confess from the heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're giving him glory that is due his name. We give glory. The focus here is to the glory of God the Father. One, because the Father is the architect of salvation. And when he exalts Jesus Christ, he is declaring that his plan of salvation has been followed through on, that it has come about. And we declare Jesus Christ is Lord, it brings glory to the Father who is planned and who's, who is also lifted up and exalted. Christ, again, in John 17, in, the, in his prayer to his Father, opens his prayer actually, spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. It is to the glory of the Father that Christ carried out his plan of the plan of salvation, executed it as he ought to have done. And Christ desired the glory of the Father, and so he came in humble obedience and submitted and executed that plan of salvation. But the Father is also glorified. Because the Father, just as Christ desires the glory of the Father, so the Father desires the glory of the Son. And when the Son, is, when the Father exalts the Son, He does so because He wants the Son to be, to be exalted and praised and worshipped as He ought to be done. And so when you and I bow the knee to Jesus in true faithful worship, it gives glory to the Father because he's, he's, He delights in the fact that we are giving His Son His due. John 5, verses 22 to 23 Jesus makes these statements. He said, the statement, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Part of His glory, His exaltation. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. 
We dishonor the Father when we do not bow the knee in faith and say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Sinclair Ferguson uh, explains this, uh, these words in this way. He said, in other words, Jesus' exaltation and our recognition of it please God. The final way God the Father is glorified is that the Father represents the Trinity. And Jesus Christ manifests the triune glory to us. We saw that his work as prophet. Jesus Christ as prophet displays and teaches us about God. He reveals God to us. We considered that a few weeks ago. And as prophet, he reveals the glory of God, which is so brightly seen in the perfect plan of salvation. And so the Father is glorified because Jesus continues to reveal to us just all the implications, the beauty and the glory of our salvation. You see, Jesus Christ's work was not ultimately about your salvation, but it was about the Father's glory. And He brings glory to Him. He he declares, when He declares that, come to me all the ends of the earth and be saved, and He declares and He calls us and He saves us, it's to the glory of the Father and to the glory of the whole triune God. Therefore, you and I are called to worship Jesus Christ. Worship the highly exalted Jesus Christ as Lord, and so bring glory to God. That is why Jesus came, why He humbled Himself, and why He has been exalted for the glory of God. This morning we've considered the exalted glory of Jesus Christ, exalted His exalted honor now sitting at the right hand of God from where He continues His mediatorial work. He does love you. He does care for you. You have been saved to the glory of God, and He will continue that work. This, this, uh, this teaching of, of on, on the exaltation of Jesus Christ has direct application to you and direct implications for your life. To confess Jesus means you must submit to Him fully. It means you must submit to Him in service, in serving Him according to what His Word commands and according to what His providence brings, whatever trials, troubles, As you endure through his providence, you do so in a humble submission to Jesus Christ, who is king and ruler over all. And you, when you face these things, or when you come to the commands of Scripture, must be humble and obedient, just like he was. You must submit and obey in humility in your whole life, in every single area of your life without exception. As we saw last week, you will never humble yourself more than Jesus Christ humbled himself. And you need to follow Him in humility. Your whole life is to be lived in humble obedience to Jesus Christ, following after Him. And with that humble obedience comes suffering. You and I, if we want, you, you and I, to follow Christ means to suffer like Christ suffered, not to atone for sin, but to follow and to submit ourselves to His life for the glory of God, whatever He calls us to do. It may mean you'll be rejected for a job or you'll be fired. It may mean you'll be harassed by the government and called to do that which is demands obedience that you cannot give. It may mean you'll be thrown in jail, you'll be abused, you'll be killed. But in all things, brothers and sisters, you must give up you to serve Him. He is your Lord. And brothers and sisters, if you will enter glory... You must be humble, and you must be willing to suffer. To enter glory means humility and suffering. This is what Christ has certainly declared and what the evidence of the martyrs through the history of the church have shown. But the good news and the news that follows this that is so closely tied to it is that glory does come to you who bow the knee to Jesus Christ and by His grace undergo whatever implications that means for your life. You follow the same path of Christ in humility and suffering, but you'll also follow Christ into glory. Jesus Christ has declared that those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. And He's demonstrated that by His own life. He was humbled. He humbled Himself, but He has rightly been exalted by the Father. And as He says so clearly, the servant is not greater than his master. If they've done these things to me, how much more will they do these things to you? But Paul, as he writes near the end of his life, having suffered much for the sake of the kingdom, as he, as he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, he says, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. So this is a faithful saying, if we, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If you endure what Christ calls you to endure by His grace, 
You will reign with Him. You will enter glory with Him. You will be exalted by Him. Fear not then what it means to be humbled and to live obediently before God. He will not abandon you. Jesus Christ will be with you, and He will take you through to that, that final end of your own glorification. He won't abandon you, but He'll give you every grace until glory. Thomas Watson writes, do you ask the question, do you think that when Christ is so highly advanced and has all power in heaven and earth in His hand, He will not take care of His elect and turn the most astonishing providences to the good of His church? We know the answer to that. Of course, he's going to care. Of course, he's going to use his powers. He does as our mediator to save us and to maintain our salvation. Paul tells the Philippians this in Philippians in chapter 3, as he reminds them, he says, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in your confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. And until He comes to usher you into glory, trust Him to give you the grace that you need and walk in humility and in holiness and submit to Him in all things. We can sing to the glory of God. We can pray to the glory of God. But let our lives be a testimony to the glory of God and demonstrate to the world that we serve a different Lord than they do and that we serve a different Lord than any lords, the so-called lords this world will throw at us or claim to be. We serve Jesus Christ. May your life work be the work of exalting Jesus Christ and that others would see Him in His glory too and they with you would bow the knee and confess with their tongues that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we confess to You that You are Lord. And we pray that You would give us every grace to live out that confession in every part of our lives. We acknowledge that we're often fearful and worry. As we think about the future, we can perhaps imagine all sorts of things, but we don't need to imagine all sorts of things. We can trust you through them, that whatever comes, whatever trials, whatever suffering, whatever humility you require of us, that you will give us the grace to do so. Oh Lord, if there are any this morning who have made a cheap confession of Christ, said it out loud but don't have it in their heart, we pray that you would change them and give them to make a true confession of Jesus as Lord. And that for each one of us who does so, that in every area of our lives, we would live that out, that we would demonstrate that this actually is a transforming statement for our whole lives. Each one of us has areas where, Lord, we've, we've sought to still maintain some of our own control and be our own lords. We pray that you would forgive us and change us. You know what that is. You know our hearts. So change and and apply this text in those areas too. But we thank and praise you, O Lord Jesus, that you have not gone to glory and left us alone. You've not left us orphans. You've not abandoned us, but you continue to strengthen us day by day. You continue, your spirit dwells in us. You continue to strengthen us to walk as you walk. So help us daily, day by day to do so and give us great joy. For when we confess Jesus Christ as Lord, we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Blessed be your name. Thank you for this wonderful truth. Thank you for changing our lives by it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing hymn 585 in response. Hymn 585, take my life and let it be.
our great God and go in his peace. Peace to the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen.